activity-based costing and customer profitability analysis. Customer profitability analysis is kind of a throw-in at the end of the chapter, but it's very interesting and could be very relevant for some of you. Okay. So Monica, David, and Lou went out to dinner. They each ordered a pizza, a personal pan pizza. They were kind of eating kind of cheap. Monica got pepperoni, David got plain, Lou got it with mushrooms and onions. And they charged by the, um, the added, add-in. And Lou was really hungry. She said, hey, let's get an appetizer. <laughs> and Monica and David said, uh, okay, they're not nice people. Yeah, let's get an appetizer. And they kind of split the appetizer. And, you know, maybe Lou ate a little more than her share because she was hungrier. But they had some. Then they're done. And Lou's still hungry. Let's get dessert we could share. <laughs> and they got some dessert. And they had, they didn't even want dessert, but they, you know, they had to get it. And they each had a bite. And Lou had the rest. <laughs> then the bill came. How do you split that bill? <laughs> not by third. <laughs> you don't want to pay for it. Yeah, Dave, I'll not pay my third. I'll not pay anything. <laughs> the pro proportion that you ate. Okay. That might be hard to judge because then David likes to feel a little bit of that stuff. I'm not looking. <laughs> Proportion you ate, some way unequal. So you, you charge them individually by how much their individual pizzas cost. And then you just say, because we all agreed, we'll, we'll pay for a third, a third, a third on the appetizer. And, okay. Or you could just pay a third, a third, a third. I mean, when I go out to dinner, that's all we ever do, right? Don't think about it. You figure that's going to even out over time. Okay, so that's the um, cost allocation problem. Think about the pizzas as the direct costs, direct labor, or materials, and the appetizer, and the dessert as the stuff you've got to figure out how to split up fairly among the parties. And in the real world, in the business world, you're not going to be so nice to say, let's go a third, a third, a third. You want to avoid that, but you're going to be judged on that. So you will talk about the strategic role of activity-based costing, ABC, the steps in developing and the benefits of an activity-based cost. We'll go through an example. Will you calculate a product cost under volume-based and activity-based methods? And you'll see that you might get different um, overhead assignments and therefore maybe make different strategic decisions. You know, the, the example we use is a, you know, kind of a one that's meant to give us different, different results. We'll talk about using cost of capacity rather than the actual amount of units used and the advantages of cost of capacity. We'll talk about activity-based management, which is an offshoot of activity-based costing, and a specific type of activity-based management, which is customer profitability analysis. Got another check mark. We're getting there. We can check off process costing now, and we're going to be working on activity-based costing. So volume-based costing, which is the historical way it's been done over time, is sometimes, often, judgment, inadequate. Indirect cost allocation, overhead is based on a volume 
of output of resource usage. However, that volume does not necessarily um, match how those indirect costs are really utilized. And you know, the, the clearest case for that is Um, let's say you're using your volume of direct labor hours. You know, if you have a high-end product and a low-end product, it's quite possible you sell a lot fewer of your high-end product than your low-end product, which is kind of mass produce. But that high-end product requires more labor hours per unit um, just to get it right. But if you use volume-based um, accounting that's proportional to output, the low-end product is going to pay disproportionately for the, for the product. And we'll see that. I, I say it here, but we'll see it again. And it provides less, if not no, incentive to control your indirect costs. Since indirect cost and value-based costing is based upon something direct, it's based upon direct labor hours, you don't have an incentive to say, how can I reduce these indirect costs? Some of them are uncontrollable, but others might be controllable, maybe rags. The, uh, I'll just use rags, it doesn't matter. I need more rags, I'll get more rags. It's indirect, it doesn't matter. But if you had some, you know, or supplies in, in, a, in an accounting firm, you know, just let, don't, don't lock the supply room, just let everyone go in and take as many pads as they want, take them home and sell them on the black market. So, you don't have any incentive to control it if you're not being managed on it. <coughs> And this is the most important point, is that volume-based costing may cause cost subsidization. Meaning, some products will be overcosted and others will be undercosted, and you'll make bad decisions. That's the whole, that goes back to this right up here. Activity-based costing, which is more and more in vogue now, uses detailed information about the activities that make up indirect costs. And out, your outputs are charged much more directly towards the resources that were consumed. So it's much better to do. Once again, is the cost associated with it? Is it worth the cost? That's always the question. Everything should have a cost benefit um, associated with it. So volume-based costing may be right for some companies. Um, first of all, if your indirect costs are a very small part of your total costs, um, then don't go crazy about trying to exactly figure out how to allocate those indirect costs. They, they may be immaterial. This may be the case in accounting firms where the costs of I mean, the indirect costs are relatively small compared to the overall costs. You know, labor dwarfs all other costs. If the activities supporting production are simple, low cost, and homogenous across product lines, if your product lines are kind of doing the same thing and using the same overhead, then you don't need to, you know, split with fine hairs, you know, how much is going to one product line or another. You could probably use general techniques to get it done. So, but if you have a high-end product and a low-end product, you want to be a little more careful. But if they're kind of uh, maybe a drug company that, that in production is producing lots of pills, but you know, it's relatively the same process, different raw materials going into them, you may not need to do activity-based costing there. So industries that use volume-based costing, as I said, accounting firms probably still can use them, and commodities firms. When you think about making drugs, that's a commodity at some point. Selling oil, that's a commodity. So it might be right for some companies. Okay, so I've mentioned this before, maybe you all could think about it. Why do product costing systems that use a single volume-based co cost driver tend to overcost 
high volume products. And what's the undesirable effect of this cost distortion? Anybody? Why would you tend to overcost high volume products? Well, if you're assigning costs based upon volume, what would be happening if you had a high volume product and a low volume product? Which, 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 um, you're going to assign a lot of costs to the high volume. And this is overhead costs. If you're going to assign more to the high volume product, what has to be true? in order to make it a fair assignment. Exactly. Exactly. So that each unit produced, whether high volume or low volume, is going to require the same overhead. And in fact, probably those lower volume, higher end goods require more, disproportionately more. The, the amount of disproportionately more is different by product, by company. So they require more. So the high volume product is subsidizing the low volume, high end product. And what's the undesirable strategic effect of this distortion? Someone else? Sure, you might try to reduce costs on the wrong. It might even be worse than that, right? You might think you're making a profit on something that you're actually losing money on. But exactly, you're on the right path. Okay. Okay. So that's the risk with volume-based costing, which even with that risk, it's totally appropriate for some companies at some times. So let's move to. Activity-based costing. Talk about some key terms. An activity is a task. Production setup could be a task. Um, we'll see a lot of tasks. A resource is an economic element consumed in the performance of a task like salaries and supplies are economic resources. Resource consumption dro cost drivers, cost drivers is the key term there, but resource consumption cost drivers measure the amount of resource that's being consumed. So if your activity is production setup, the resource consumption cost driver is the number of labor hours necessary to complete production setup. Activity consumption cost drivers measure the amount of activity performed. So the number of production setups you need. You know, if you're M&M &M Mars and you're making, one, one day you're making regular M&Ms, the next day you're making peanut M&Ms. You need to set up the machines each time, assuming you're making them on the same machine. So there are three steps in developing an ABC system. The first step is the activity analysis, where you identify your, your specific Resource, resources, resource costs, and activities. So you, you identify your activities and your costs for each of those activities. This is an operations research, industrial engineering type of function. 
Um, will you identify the activities and how they consume resources? Then you assign costs to the activities using your resource consumption cost drivers we just talked about. Direct labor hours, something like that. And then ultimately, you assign these costs as consumption, activity consumption cost drivers to your cost objects, whatever that cost object is. Normally a product, but as we'll see, it could be a customer. Let's go through it. So step one, activity analysis. The fun part, you have to gather information about the company. You, get, you use documentation and records, you interview. We got an entire class on interview techniques so that you get unbiased, real answers. You use questionnaires, questionnaire and time study analyses um, for observation. Sample questions that you might include in these analyses would be what work or activity are you doing? How much time do you spend performing these activities? What resources do you need to complete them? What value does it have for the product, service, customer, or organization? This one is really used for activity-based management to figure out whether that activity makes sense to do in the future or, or how you're going to use it. So obviously, you just can't ask these questions blindly. The answer may have some biases in it as someone is protecting their job or their compensation level or whatever else they're doing. So you need to be careful how you ask these questions and you observe the answers so you get to the right answer. That's the activity analysis. Once you know what the activities are, you need to categorize them into one of four categories. Unit level activities are performed on each unit of product or service. So unit level activities, you know, direct materials. Um, that I brought in are per unit of activity. Batch level activities are performed on a group of units, setting up machinery to process a group of units. Product level activities support a specific product. So as you're changing the product engineering, for instance, that's for the overall product. So unit level, batch level, and product level. At facility level um, are those drivers that support a specific facility, taxes, insurance, etc. So all of these costs or, 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 or activities are so categorized. And then for each one of them, you determine the appropriate driver. Could be the number of direct labor hours, could be the number of setups, the number of moves, machine hours, number of employees for facilities that might be square footage. Um, so you figure out a driver that's appropriate for each one of them at a detailed level. Bless you. And then you assign costs based upon the level of activity. So if it's direct labor hours, it's, you, know, you assign costs based upon how many labor hours are used. If it's driven by purchase order, number of purchase orders, you assign costs based upon number of purchase orders, et cetera. And that, in essence, is activity-based costing. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, you get to do something. Ten times. Okay, so machine shop has the following activities. Classify each activity as a batch, a 
a unit batch product or facility level activity, and then come up with a potential cost driver. You know what? Let's make it short. Let's do the first five. You don't need to do all ten. and you look so lonely over there in the corner. Why don't you go? <laughs> so does everybody pretty much sit in the same seat class after class? We're going to shake that up. Got to get you out of your comfort zones. Um, it's going to be tough because people don't have their slide in front of them. I got it. I'm not, not, not immediately, but I got it soon. Okay, you got it.
Okay, let's see what we got here. What level is machine ops? Machine operations. <laughs> How many say units? How many say batch? How many say products? How many say facility? That's awesome. <laughs> the answer key says unit. <laughs> Back row. Let's assume unit for the moment. What would be a, um, a reasonable cost driver for machine operation? Maybe a little more specific. <laughs> oh, you, you, you may have a volume of uh, volume of product. Okay. That would make it unit level. Any others? Machine hours. Slightly different. Both of them should work. Machine setup. What level is that? I may say unit, batch, product. Greg, raise your hand. Thank you. <laughs> batch. Because each batch, you could have multiple products. You go back and forth between products. And what would be a good um, driver? What's always a good? For a batch, they, they tend to have the same one. N number of setups. And then each setup would have a setup number of hours. Number of machines, and then you'd have to have, relate that to a setup time and a setup hour. Ultimately, it, it get, you have to get back to the number of setup hours to get it done. And you could do it by machine, potentially. Production scheduling. <laughs> I don't know. I think for the other class I'm going to do six through ten. <laughs> um, how many say units? Oh, front row. How many say batch? Couple not so proud. How many say product? A lot of people. How many say facility? For what it's worth, the answer is batch. <laughs> Moon is like me. <laughs> this could be in a custom um, shop where you get, a, you get an order and you create a batch of, a, you know, a printing shop. You have to print a number of copies of something. So you have to schedule production to print that, that number of copies. So you have a batch, a book. Maybe if they, if you, back in the day when there used to be paper-based books, you'd schedule a book for production, that'd be a batch run. Uh, materials receipt. What's that? Oh, cost driver. I'm sorry. Um, number of orders. E each order. Materials receipt. I feel like I should definitely make this a question on the test. <laughs> Or comic relief. <laughs> Materials receipts. Who says unit? Who says batch? Who says product? Who says facility? Okay, the um, answer key says batch or product. 
either one. With number of receipts or the number of purchase orders, which drives the materials you need to receive. Um, number of receipts. Right, you're probably ordering from multiple units, right? You're not going to. You're not going to build. I mean, I guess if you're a. Um, it's not. It's, it's what does it take to produce those materials? And so, um, Caterpillar, who's building some kind of a specialized product, is going to order for 50 of them because they're going to build 50 of them. A batch of batch. Today we're going to build 50 of these. I don't even know what, you know, super kind of things that they produce. And so they're not ordering it for one, they're ordering it for 50. Based upon so purchase orders to buy, you know, someone's purchased 50 of them somewhere. So the question would be, since they also, since you just said you need materials, but the batch is bigger than anything, is the question you have to figure out what is the largest? Yeah, yeah, what's the, what's the largest? Otherwise everything would be units and we can go home. which is probably a goal. Okay, R&D. Who says unit? Liz, unit? Yeah. Batch, product, facility. Wow, it's fascinating. It's like, over with. Product. Because you won't do it by, you're doing R&D on a product, not on a, you know. Yeah, but the facility wise, like the, like the facility wise, like the facility wise, like the facility wise, like allocated It should be allocated to that product. If you're doing R&D to create the next generation statin, it should be, that R&D should go towards that product. It shouldn't go towards the facility. <laughs> it, you know, you, you, where it's being produced, where it's, because quite often R and D is in its own facility somewhere, right? R and D, you know, you have you have your engineers and your your scientists somewhere together. Okay, does anyone see in the bottom five? Oh, the cost driver. Um, number of new product, number of new products, maybe for R and D. Um, just to finish off, is there anything here that might be a facility level? We haven't had any of those. Okay. Machine maintenance. I think that's right. That, that's, yeah, that's probably product level or batch. Probably batch level. Let me see. Let's go. Let's say you're using, but maybe not. Let's go to M&M's who's producing regular M&M's and peanut M&M's out of the same machines. Every month you have to go in and maintain those machines. It's not related to regular M&M's or... Well, some R&D that fails, you would probably have to allocate across everything, but successful R&D, you know, all over. It's not totally, I, absolutely not totally black and white. But your, your earlier point is go to the largest possible. So that it, well, it's really not only the largest, the most appropriate. You don't, you don't want to assign it to the corporate entity as a whole. That would be the largest, right? Because that doesn't give you any information. Right. Okay, well, that was certainly more fun than I expected. <laughs> the last five answers, okay. And by the way, you have a homework problem that does this for a different kind of industry. Facility, product, product, unit or batch, and batch. I don't have not made the test yet. Well, that gives you more chances to get the right answer. Unit, batch, batch, oh, I'm sorry. Facility, product, product, unit batch, unit or batch, batch. 
machine hours, engineering change notices, or the number of modifications, number of products, a few different choices there. Part, number of parts, number of products, number of purchase orders here. Number of uh, inspection hours, number of batches, number of units here. Materials handling, um, number of loads, weight of the materials. This is for movement of materials from one place to another. Number of specific moves you need to do. So there are a few different possibilities. OK. Haywood Printing is processing a job with the following activities and rates. Uh, you, you all have 30 seconds, maybe? If this job requires five hours for 1,000 copies, what is the activity based cost for this job? It requires it's per hour and five cents per copy. Someone who hasn't had a chance to gain some of those very important participation credits today. It's 90. <laughs> no tricks. Five hours times eight dollar plus a thousand times 0 0.05. That's 40 plus 50 is 90. So uh, an extraordinarily simplified example of activity-based cost. Okay, go home. <laughs>